Uh, If you have your Bibles, you could turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, we've already made it there. Boy, it feels like we flew through those last 13 chapters, didn't we? Just made it right through there. Acts chapter 14, we're calling today's message as we're talking about a work in progress. As you read through this passage, what it reminds me of is a downward spiral. You, you've heard that phrase before, downward spiral. It's, it's a series of thoughts or actions that feed back into itself in such a way to cause the situation to become progressively worse, right? You, you've you've kind of seen this. So we have a picture here of maybe what a, uh, the downward spiral might look like. It's, it's this thought of that your actions just keep leading to worse actions, that you make a decision, it, it leads to worse decisions. And so um, I think we'll... Uh, when you're thinking about that, there's maybe two ways that you could think about this downward spiral of what it looks like and maybe what it feels like. One would be with depression. A person who's battling depression, you know, that they have a, um, a depressing thought about just the way life is or about the situation, and that actually leads them to a, another even more depressing thought, and maybe that leads to a bad action. They're going to uh, oversleep or, or they can't sleep, and so they're going to stay up and worry, and it's just going to spiral out of control. You see how it kind of gets uh, worse and worse as it goes. Another way we think about this downward spiral would be with drug addiction. That there'll be some type of, uh, normally that you hear people use a phrase like a gateway drug, and it's, you know, they're, they're going to do something small, whether it be like a prescription medicine, and, and then it gets worse, that gets out of control, or maybe it's, uh, you know, something at a party that is their first drink of alcohol was at a party, and that led to more alcohol, and, and before long, it spirals out of control, and they find themselves almost like, uh, I mean, this is maybe a little bit of a brass uh, example here, but it's like flushing a toilet. <laughs> it just swirls around and you find themselves, they say, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just making worse and worse deci- decisions because of this. I, I would tell you now, I'm going to make a statement that may sound a little bit political, so please, uh, I, I'm not going too political here, but on Tuesday, I, I've never in five years mentioned something from the pulpit before, but I will tell you this. On Tuesday, there is something to vote about. You should pray about it. It's the legalization of marijuana for recreational use. And I would just tell you this, that when we think about a downward spiral and talk about a gateway drug, I'm not saying that everyone who's ever drank became an alcoholic, but I can tell you all the alcoholics said they started with a drink. And, and I would say anybody who's an addict would say they started with a sampling of something. And, and so I, I'm I want to be careful here. Let me just tell you what Mayo Clinic says. Mayo Clinic says this, drug addiction or substance abuse uh, disorder is a disease that affects a person's brain and behavior and leads them to the inability to control the use of a legal or illegal drug or medicine. Substances such as alcohol, marijuana, or nicotine are also considered drugs. When you're addicted, you may continue using the drug even despite the harm that it causes your own body or those around you. Drug addiction can start with the experimental use of recreational drugs in social situations, and for some people, the drug becomes more and more frequent. For others, particularly those with opioid uh, drug addiction, it begins when they take a prescription medicine or receive them from others who have that prescription. And it's this downward spiral where um, we can all relate to this, whether it be through decisions, but you remember I saw this back in high school. They would show the picture of the before and after. And I know the pictures aren't very, aren't very big there, but it's the person who was kind of their normal standard self, and then they spiraled out of control and where they ended. And if we had room for all the picture, it would list all these different drugs, and you can see the downward spiral even physically that a person has. Now, I, I promise I will not get too political, but I think there's something beyond being political, and it is spiritual that we have a responsibility to help people not spiral out of control. So as political as I just went there, I'm not a politician, I'm not a doctor, so I know I was quoting Mayo Clinic there, but I can tell you this, there's a very real spiritual downward spiral as well. And that's what we're going to read here out of um, Acts chapter 14. We see this all through scripture, these people who spiral out of control. It happens in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, man and woman were created in the image of God. Yet you see by chapter 4, there's begun this downward spiral. It starts as a, as a wide swath, right? And then before long, it begins to to kind of hone in and get worse and worse and worse. And you see that in Genesis chapter 1 through 4 with the story of Cain and Abel. That Cain, who was created in the image of God, eventually kills Abel. 
And what is it that God says? He says, sin is crouching at your door. Now, instead of being the image of the invisible God, the representation of who is God's goodness, you've become, you, you're acting like an animal. He says, sin is crouching at your door. That's Genesis. We could go to Romans. Romans gives a great example of this downward spiral, right? You read Romans chapter 1. Those suppress the truth. Then 20, verse 21, it says they don't honor God. Then it says they're futile in their thinking and their hearts are darkened. And then lust fills their hearts in verse 24. Then they have dishonorable passions in verse 26. And then by 28, they have a depraved mind. They've, you see, they've spiraled out of control. They, they stop even believing in the existence of God. And then their, their passions get out of control. And you can kind of see this whirlwind where it spirals down. And next thing you know, their life is a total wreck. This is Romans 1. We could also read the same thing in James chapter 1 when it talks about temptation. It says, temptation happens when we're dragged away and enticed by our own desires. And then when those desires grow, they give birth to sin. And sin, whenever it's conceived, it gives birth to what? To death. You see there's this spiral out of control. And I'm going to tell you here, in Acts chapter 14, we're going to see this same exact spiral. What happens in Acts chapter 14? It says that some of them... Did not believe. It depending on what translation that you'll read, it might say they were disobedient, right? They hear the message, but they don't believe. But their spiral continues from there to say they poison the other people's minds. It's not enough for them not to believe. Now they don't want anyone to believe. And then it goes from there to the fact that they, they cause division in the group. And then it even progresses to the point that they will become murderers, at least in their heart. They desire to stone Paul and Barnabas. So that's the kind of where we're headed today, just to let you know where we're headed. If you would, stand in honor of the reading of God's word. We're in Acts chapter 14, verse 1. We're talking about Paul and Barnabas in Iconium. Would you read that with me? At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. And there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles, and they poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly about the Lord, who confirmed their message of grace by by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews together with the leaders to mistreat them and to stone them. But they found out about it, and they fled to Lyconium and the cities of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask that today that you would speak to our hearts. Father, I pray that there wouldn't be a person in this room that would not be so overwhelmed with their life spiraling out of control that they would not realize that if they would simply look to you, they could be saved. And that there's no situation in life that they could not look to you and be rescued. Father, we thank you that you're a God that rescues. Father, I thank you that you're a God that saves. And Father, as we study the text today, Father, would you allow our hearts to be open and responsive to how your spirit speaks to us. Father, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the first thing we see as we we find out what happens here is that they have approached another synagogue. They've come to the new town, and this has been their pattern so far. Every place they've gone, when they come to the town, they go to the synagogue. And what happens, very similar to what we talked about last week, I'm sure they said, oh, we've got a guest, a guest rabbi. And so they read from a passage, I'm sure, and then they said, do you have any word of encouragement? Which would have been the pattern we saw last week, would have been a very traditional synagogue service. You think of how long these people have gone to a synagogue service, they've heard the reading of the law and the prophets, and they've sat there, but there's something different about what happens this day. It says that they spoke so effectively. Now think about that. What is effective preaching? They spoke so effectively that some believed. This is a pretty good thing because we have a tendency in our society to to throw things away if they don't work. However, there's also things that we hold on to that have never worked, but yet we hold on to them. Don and I, uh, I've got, we've got a can opener that we were given uh, as a wedding gift, I believe, and uh, that thing is junk. But we have kept it for years. Every time I open a can, I think I'm throwing this thing away. 
And I'm going to buy, and do it, have we? Nope, it's been all these years. The thing is absolute trash, but we just won't throw it away, even though it doesn't work. Now, what I would hate to say is that preaching has become ineffective. But if we're to maybe categorize to say there is effective preaching and there is uneffective preaching. So what would we categorize as effective? It says, your translation, the NIV, is the one that says they spoke so effectively. Some, some translations don't put effectively in there. It just says they spoke such that they believed. And really, the translation effectively is a great translation because there was something about the preaching that convinced people to say, oh, we should believe this. Right? So what happens in effective preaching? Because the last thing I would want you to have as a pastor is a broken can opener. You say, we, we, we come and we smile and sometimes we entertain, sometimes we laugh, sometimes it gets political about once every five years. You know, I don't know what you'll think of the sermons or not, but what I'd hate for you to say is it's like a broken can opener. So let me just give you a couple things that I think lead to or maybe are results of effective preaching. Number one, God has to be glorified. If it's going to be an effective sermon, God has to be glorified. We already saw the story of what happens to Herod, how it's kind of like tremors. He's eaten by the worms, right? And Because he took the glory for himself. So number one, God alone is glorified. Number two is that Christ is correctly portrayed as the only means of salvation. If It should be concerning if there's a message that goes through and the name of Christ was not even mentioned. That should, all, that should be a red flag. Good. Effective preaching is going to be Christ-centered Preaching, number three, is the word of God would be taught accurately. There's always going to be those people who are going to manipulate what the word of God says. But in Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, he says uh, that you should rightly divide the word of truth. That is, you're going to teach it correctly, right? But here, here's number four. I've got five things. Number four is that the gospel would be presented. If I could give you the gospel in a nutshell, here's what it is is that you and I, we have a debt of sin. It says in Romans 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have this debt, and there's different ways people try to pay off the debt. Most people in the Midwest have this Christian moralistic thinking. That is, we try to live according to the Ten Commandments. We try to be good. We try to honor our parents. That's a good thing. We try not to lie. We try not to lust. We try not to steal. We have all of those type of qualities, but the problem is... We are never made righteous by obeying those laws. We still have a debt of sin. And so what the gospel is, is that Jesus Christ came and died to pay for our sin. The wage of sin is death. And what did Christ do? He took the sin upon him, died on the cross on our behalf, that anyone who would believe and confess would be saved. It says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's the gospel in a nutshell. There ought to be in every sermon some evangelistic, gospel-centered portion of it, right? And we say, here's how you could be saved. Amen? And here's the last thing I would tell you about effective preaching. It requires a response. If it's going to be effective preaching, there has to be, for every person in the room, there has to be something that leads us to say, we must now change. We we weren't as godly as we once thought we were an hour ago. Hopefully, it's not an hour-long sermon. We'll just see how it goes, okay? I'm just starting to get warmed up, so maybe it will be. All right, come on, just preach it, right? No one? Chiefs don't play till 720. We got time. Just joking, the Bills play at noon. All right, let's get this... Let's get this going for the, for the act of grace for having the Bills fans. Just joking. Um, here's what effective preaching is. It demands of every hearer. You can no longer stay the same. Listen, if you, li- if you have sat under preaching and it has not changed you, it has not been effective preaching. Now, it could affect you one of two ways. Let's be clear of that. Your heart would either get harder or your heart would get softer. It would either become more moldable that God would change you and conform you to the image of Christ, or it's going to become harder. You're going to, there are some people, I've been around church, one of the worst cussings I ever got was on a mission trip. Can you believe that? On a mission trip, and we we're packing a van, and this guy just went ballistic. I didn't know if he was saved. I thought maybe he lost it on the trip. You know, it's a long way down there to Mexico. And so I, I didn't know if he left it in a bag or what. But man, he just went off, and I thought, what's with this guy? This guy had been to church his whole life, and he was hard. He was even doing evangelism and missions, but yet he had not been changed. His heart had been hardened. Listen, you hear it, listen to effective preaching, it will change you. 
You're, gonna, you're either going to be softer to the Lord, more moldable, or more calloused. It forces you to make a choice, and that's what we see in Iconium, isn't it? There are those who believed and those who chose not to. And every person in the room today, if this sermon is effective, you'll make a choice. Should I change? Should I run back to the Lord? Or should I just stay the course? And those who are tempted to say, I'll just stay the course, you're not staying the course. You're hardening your heart. I've seen this before. There was a a woman once at Buffalo Creek, a a young lady. She had been rescued from sex trafficking. And and I remember the first sermon that I preached, she wept through the whole sermon. And I thought, this this girl's going to commit her life to Christ. And the next week, she, she paid attention, but she didn't cry anymore. By the third week, she didn't pay attention at all. Now, that's the quickest that I've seen it, but make no mistake, you and I don't have the ability to not change. This is what's funny about marriage. Sometimes you'll hear somebody in marriage say, well, they changed. What do you think they were going to do? They're humans. We all change. This is why you, you know, when you update your driver's license and it says the same thing it did from 20 years ago, you're a liar. Your hair's not the same color. You're not the same weight. You changed. You, we all change. There's only one that's unchanging, and that's God. Isn't that great? That's what's so good about God. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But you and I, we change. And if good preaching is heard, you will change. Either become more faithful or less faithful. I preached a sermon not too long ago in Illinois for my friend Chris Scott. He asked me to come up and to do a youth revival kind of service. I said, Chris, I'm, man, I've got all this gray hair. The youth aren't going aren't gonna to like me. And he said, oh, you'll be like a grandpa. What? That didn't feel good. But here's what he said after Sunday sermon. And it's hard after you preach to describe the emotions that go on. Uh, because there's something in, in preaching where your soul's on fire. You've prayed over this message. And, and, and you know there's decisions that need to be made. And you, you know that this might be the week that people get right with God. And, and you pour out your soul. And, and it, you know, you're just so excited. And then the invitation comes. And it's this whole hodgepodge of emotions. Did anyone respond? Was anyone affected? Is there anyone who... And then there's a little bit of personal relief because all the passion that I had for the message, I I had my time frame to pour it out, right? And and so Chris, after I preached, he got up and he said this, and I wrote it down because I thought it was just really a great way to, to kind of understand what was even going on in my own heart. He said this, in effective preaching, the burden is now off the pastor. When the sermon is... The sermon is finished. He's obeyed what the Lord had laid on his heart. Now the burden has been taken off the pastor and placed on the hearer. They must now do something with the truth. And he shared that during the invitation. I thought, that's what it is. At the end of the sermon, I'm like, oh, oh, man, I just poured it all out. But now that burden that had been on me all week is now on you. What will you do with the truth? And the answer is, you'll be changed. You'll either be harder or you'll be softer. It's a dangerous thing to think, I'll wait till tomorrow to change something. Today is the day of salvation, Scripture says. There's no better day to be saved. If you're waiting, let me tell you, don't wait any longer because you don't have the ability to go unchanged. You keep hearing the gospel message and don't respond to it. Your heart naturally gets harder. And not just that. Let's think about forgiveness. People say, well, maybe time. I just need a little bit of time. That won't happen. And you know what will happen with that time? You'll just callous more and more. You better strike while the iron is hot. You read what Scripture says about having an unforgiving heart, and it should scare us. We, we, you cannot afford to hold on to bitterness. And what does Scripture say about lust? You, you know, who's going to carry fire in their bosom? You better do something right now. Now is the time to act. And what happens in Iconium is the crowd is divided into two groups, those who believe and those who don't. And let me tell you, those who don't, they think that they could just simply stay with unbelief, but that's not what happens. It's going to spiral out of control and get worse and worse. So what happens at first? The first thing we find out about this group is that they don't believe. One translation says they refuse to believe. ASV, who says they they were disobedient. NIV, I like, is they say they refuse to believe. And they're not going to stay neutral. They're They're going to be hardened in their mind and hardened in their heart. Even though the message was perfectly proclaimed, there are some people who will never believe. And that's just hard for me to swallow. They preached effectively. 
God was glorified, Christ was accurately portrayed, the gospel was preached, they accurately divided the word of truth, the word of truth was presented, and they gave them a choice, and there are still some that didn't believe. But they couldn't stop there. You see, it's never enough for someone to just not believe, because then what happens is there becomes a conviction just by being around them. And so what happens next is they don't want anyone else to believe. So they begin to poison the minds of the unbelieving. Now they're doing the work of, as Jesus said, their, their father, the devil. You, you only have, there are no, um, there are no orphan uh, children in scripture. They're either a child of the devil or they're a child of the heavenly father. There's no one who would say, I, I don't have either. You're either a child of God or, this is a tough concept, isn't it? Or you're a child of the devil. And if you're the child of the devil, guess what you'll do? Your daddy's will. You know what you do if you're the child of the king of kings, the Lord of lords? If the heavenly father is your father, you do his will. You know what happens if the devil is your father? You do his will. So what happens to these people who don't believe? They poison the mind of those around him. You think about this. There is a powerful work in the world. Ephesians 6 says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. This evil is it's moving in these un, the unbelieving to say, I don't want other people to believe. Remember how we talked about the Romans 1, the spiral in Romans 1, how they denied the existence of God, and then they, he gave them over to these carnal pleasures, and their minds become depraved? I didn't, I didn't give you this, but in verse 32, it says they desired hearty approval. It, it's the picture as the spiral gets down, these people are so out of control that it's not just that, it's, not, it's never going to be enough in society. I hope you see this in our society today. It's never going to be enough that someone accepts another person's actions. No, no. We want you to approve it. We want you to applaud it. We want you to say, now that's how to live life. Do you see that in sinfulness in the world? It's not just enough that, that we say, okay, you, you do your thing. That will never be enough. The spiral will continue until they say, like in Romans 1, that they gave hearty approval. My friend who used to drink, he said this, there's something funny about holding a beer at a party. If you're holding a beer, everyone likes you. And if you're not, no one does. I thought, that, boy, that's interesting. It, it, and I, I don't know, I mean, I know drinking is a whole different topic here, but I can tell you, if you're not participating in the sin, you're the enemy. What's wrong with you? I'll I tell you a story. I went fishing one time for smallmouth bass. I, I love fishing for smallmouth. And, and there were some guys that came out, and they, they were uh, snagging spoonbill. And they were just catching them on this river. There's a deep spot in the river, and, and they're just catching one after another. These are huge. I mean, they're, they're like the size of your body. And I said, man, you guys are really catching them. Is it, is it season? And they kind of looked at each other, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 it's season. And I'm like, do you have permission from Tom to be out here? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, Tom, Tom, yeah. Yeah, we know Tom. Dang it, I shouldn't have said the guy's name, right? That, I, should, I should have said, do you know the owner? And so if they knew. Well, it wasn't long before they said, hey, have you ever caught one? And I said, no. And they're like, we got another rod. you want to? Boy, these guys are awful friendly. And so I step over and I snag one. I, and they say, hey, let us take your picture. And so I... You know, they take my picture, and this thing, like, it's, Bill came up to here, its tail was touching the ground, it was huge, it was just a monster, and I'm like, and right as they snapped the picture, I thought, it's not season, that picture is their way to keep me from turning them in, right? Now, let me tell you, that's what happens with sinfulness. It, it's not, it's not that you're, you can be, you know, it's, it's up to you. No, no, we want your approval, we want your participation, because we don't want you turning us in. See, you even being here makes me feel convicted, right? Does that kind of make sense? So what they've done now is not only did they not believe, but now they're poisoning the minds of those around them. And what leads, what's the next step in this spiral out of control is division. The people are now divided. You think there's a million things in the world that we could divide over. We could divide over ethnicity. We could divide over politics. We could even divide over nationalism to say America's better than maybe a different country. There's a thousand different ways that we can be divided, but there's one way we can be unified, and that is when we all kneel to Jesus. And you see, what happens here is the spirals is they cause division. They're going to they're gonna mix it up so much that now they're stirring hatred in other people. Now, 
think for just a moment, the apostles had preached a message that they were willing to die for. You know what happens with these unbelievers? They have a message they're willing to kill for. And do you see how vastly different those are? One person's willing to die for their message. The other person's willing to kill for their message. Now they've divided the group, so what's the next logical, logical step? They're going to harm those who oppose them. This, again, is going down to what the devil's will is. Jesus says the devil's will in John 10, 10 is to steal, to kill, and destroy. These men genuinely hate the apostles to the point that they say, let's kill them. And I don't know if you've ever thought about what it means to stone somebody, to throw one rock after another rock after another rock until the person stops moving. Now, I've stoned a, a water moccasin before. You know, I scared to death of snakes. So me and my cousin Chris stepped up on one on the creek. And so we pick up, you know, we're just kids. And, you know, I throw a rock into the woods and Chris hits it with a snake. And I throw a rock into the creek. I'm horrible aim. And so Chris is like just battering this snake. But it took forever for it to die. He hits it and it kind of is broken back and it curls up and he hits it again. These men are filled with such hatred, they want to do that to a human being. That one rock hits and it breaks an arm. Another rock hits and, and blood begins to gush from their head. They are filled with hatred. And it simply started with what? Unbelief. You see, it spiraled, didn't it? It was unbelief turned into poisoning others' minds turned into division, and it's turned all the way into murder. Spiraled pretty quick, didn't it? So let's look real quickly at how the apostles responded. Here's some things they did. Number one, they were patient with them. You know, sometimes in life it's you that's spiraling out of control. Sometimes in life it's your loved one. Man, what do you do when you're watching them? You're watching them spiral out of control, and you're saying, oh my gosh, I don't know how to help them stop. Number one is to be patient. It says they were with them for some time. They didn't abandon right away. They, they kind of got a little bit of the mess on them, didn't they? Number one was they were patient. But secondly, they continued to speak the truth. They kept teaching a message of grace. Number one was they spent considerable time. Number two is they spoke boldly a message of grace. And number three, the power of God was on their life. God decided to confirm their message with signs and wonders. The power of God was displayed. And you and I, we can't muster up a miracle. We can't be righteous enough that God would give us a miracle. But we could ask. We could ask, Lord, would you reveal yourself in power? What did Paul tell the Corinthians when I came to you? It was not in word alone, but with power. So they were patient, they spoke boldly, they had power, but there was also a moment where they left, when it was necessary. Jesus told them whenever they were persecuted, there'd be a point there they would, they would flee to another town. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says that, that once he was stoned, when he's talking about his own hardships, he says, once I was stoned, it wasn't in Iconium, it's in the next town. And actually, after getting stoned, he goes back into the town. We'll leave that for next week. But here he escapes just in the nick of time before he's hit by any stones. So what I wanted to show you in the message today is there is a, a, a spiritual downward spiral of unbelief, poisoned mind, division, and then harming the opposition. Two ways that I want to give the invitation today is this. Number one is for those who have not yet been saved. You'd say, I've never publicly confessed Jesus Christ is my Savior. I would tell you today is the day of salvation. Do not wait. Because you don't have the ability to set under preaching and be unchanged. You'll either become softer and softer or harder and harder. And I would tell you today's the day. But secondly, I want to maybe um, also give this challenge for the believer. Because in a similar way, that spiritual downward spiral could easily be for a believer as well. That maybe you're not as close to the Lord as you once were. Maybe your heart has become a little bit harder. There, there was a song put out in 2007 by Casting Crowns called Slow Fade. Let me read the words of it to you. It says this, it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray and thoughts invade and choices are made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. Listen to the last line. People never crumble 
in a day. You think there are those unbelieving, and yeah, they poison other people's minds, they cause division, they even go on to murder, but I tell you, there's for Christians a slow fate as well. Maybe just not as soft as you used to be. Maybe the, the last time the Lord told you to do something, you said, well, no, that, that'll be weird. Maybe even during the invitation, the Holy Spirit urges you, respond, and you think, I'll talk to him afterwards. There's one last illustration I want to give, and um, it's from aviation. You know, we, we've been saying a downward spiral. In aviation, they call this downward spiral, they call it a, a, a graveyard spiral. And here's what it is, is that while they're in this plane, uh, you're, the fluid in your eardrums, if you set off kilter long enough, that fluid will shift and you'll now think this is level. So it, same way spiritually, if you're just off from where you need to be with the Lord and you stay like that long enough, you'll eventually think this is normal. So what happens in the airplane is you, you have this turn, and so that turn is, is going to be a huge circle. It may be so much you don't even notice you're doing a circle. But eventually, that circle is going to cause you to go in a downward spiral. So what your natural response is, is as you're losing altitude, and you don't realize, you think you're level, but you're just off, just a little. And as you begin to lose altitude, your natural inclination is to pull back on the, on the joystick, right? You're going to pull back, and it's going to, you're going to come out of this fall because you think you're level. But what happens in this spiral when you pull back on the joystick is that you, you're not you're not turning up because you're banking. You're actually going to make that circle sharper. So now as you're falling, now the circles are smaller. And you see on your instruments, you're still falling, and so you pull back even harder. What happens is that circle gets even tighter and even tighter. It's called a graveyard spiral. It almost always happens at night because there's no way to orientate yourself to the, to the horizon. And it's often because the person is trusting their own emotions more than they're trusting their instruments. So that spiral, as they're trying to pull out of it, they're actually pulling themselves into it. I would ask you, maybe as we come to a time of invitation to think, in all honesty, are you growing in your love for the Lord? I mean, is there a burning passion as it, and is it growing? There are many mistakes that I've made in my marriage. But I could tell you this in all, genuine, in all genuineness. I love Dawn more today than I've ever loved her before. I think that's what should happen in a healthy marriage. I, I think if you've lived a long life and you lo lose your loved one, it should be the most devastating thing in the world because you'd say, man, I, I just grew in my love for them. Listen, if that's true in marriage, how much more is it true in our love for the Lord? If you've been coming to this church and hearing, I think, godly preaching, being a part of Bible studies, are you growing in your love for the Lord? Or have you just maybe been a little bit off and maybe you don't realize there's a downward spiral? Number two, are you still bearing fruit? I was sent a text message this morning from a dear friend. It just read John 15, 4 and 5. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him... He will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me ask you, is your life bearing more fruit? What are they again? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Are, are those things growing in you? Do you find yourself to be more patient? Do you find yourself to be more kind? Do you find yourself to be more loving? How about joy? Could I ask this? Have you found yourself in the last year to be more joyous? Jesus said, my joy I give you, not as the world gives, but I, I give you my joy that your joy may be complete. Are you growing in that, or ha have you noticed that there's a downward spiral in your joy? Let me ask you one last one. How about just your connection? There's a reason why we did this family initiative. It wasn't just to boost numbers. We don't really care about reporting numbers. It it's to ask you this question, are you connecting? You know what I find? There are people who say, yeah, I used to be real involved. Yeah, I, I, we used to come Wednesday nights. We used to come to Sunday school. And part of their downward spiral, you could even see it in their calendar, just not as involved. 
I'd ask you, how connected are you to the body? The last thing I want is to give an emotional response. I think I could craft that. But what I don't want is for you to just try harder. Just to, to pull back on the controls to say, I'll, I'll pull out of this fall. I'll, and all you'll find is that the harder you try, you'll just spiral. What I would tell you, friends, is what Scripture tells us. One of my favorite verses, Proverbs 21, 13. If you conceal your sin, you won't prosper. But if you confess it, you find mercy. We're a confessing people. We're not a works people. What do you do when you find yourself falling out of control? You confess it. You go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I have fallen and I need your help. And that is the act, the simple act of faith of going to the Lord and saying, I have messed up. We believe that's what changes people. That's what saves a person. You go and you confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart and God saves you. It's not on the works that you did. Same thing when you're a believer. You find your life spiraling out of control. What do you run back to? Confession. Lord, I need you. I am off kilter. And I want to come back. I ask that today the Holy Spirit would speak to your hearts and that you'd respond as he leads you. Now, if that means that you need to come to the altar to pray, you do that. If that means you need to just kneel down there in your row and pray. If you just need to bow your head while we sing and pray, you do that. If you want to respond and talk to somebody, maybe there's somebody else in the church, you say, I trust you and I need some help. You respond. We said last week we were going to start giving multiple ways to respond. And I want to tell you what they are because you might be the person who is just dead afraid of responding. We have messenger we have a Facebook account. You could just send us a message. Could I, could I come and talk to somebody this week? And you could email the church. You could call the church as you're leaving. Say, man, this week, is there somebody who could meet with me? But what I would tell you now is don't leave this place without responding in some way if God has spoken to you. I'm going to pray. And if God has spoken to your heart, you respond as he leads you. Father, I thank you. that your arm is not too short to save. Father, I thank you for the message that you gave Paul that day in Iconium and that you gave him the ability to preach it so effectively that, that people believed. They heard the truth and they believed. Father, we ask that today that it be your spirit that would deliver the message in perfection to men and women's hearts and that today for the first time There'd be people here who'd say, I want to publicly confess Jesus Christ as my Savior. And Father, I thank you also for your Spirit's ability to speak to people's hearts whose lives are possibly spiraling out of control. And today would be the day that you'd tell them just to simply confess again their need for you, to remember the height from which they've fallen, to repent and go and do the deeds they did at first. Father, I pray that you would speak to the hearts and the minds of the people here today. And would you give us courage to respond? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.